Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to church. Good to see you again. I haven't seen you since the last time we talked about something controversial, but I'm glad you're back. All right, our speaker today is uh, OPAC Vice President Bob Donahue, and he might be assisted by former legal counsel Ted Rosier. Rosier? Rosier. Uh, Rosier for you Oklahomans. Actually, I'll take the Swiss pronunciation. That's fine. Very good. So what he's going to do is uh, kind of talk about the book, The Pink Swastika, and some of how the homosexual agenda is uh, affected negatively our political climate and our freedom and so forth. So I just want to give it over now to, oh, Ted? Ted Rosier is going to go now. Please welcome Ted Rosier. Yeah, well, you want to come do it? All right, um, most of the, Bob's got most of the presentation on the pink swastika, but what they asked me to do was maybe to give you guys a little bit of a background on, on the political climate in Nazi Germany and kind of how things, how they came to power and stuff. And um, it's important, I've, I've studied this uh, quite a bit, and it's important to understand the parallels, the historical parallels between what happened in Germany in the 1920s and 30s and what we're going through right now. And I think as we go through this, you'll see, and every, everything I'm going to say is totally factual. Uh, there will be no spin on any of it. It's all true, and, and, uh, and I hope that you'll understand, especially that really we need to know where, where history, we need to know, know our history and know what happened in the past to make sure that we know where we're going. You know, those who don't know history are doomed to repeat it, and I think we're repeating some of this right now, as you'll see. Um, all right, uh, the Weimar Republic, or Weimar, I guess, if you're doing German pronunciation, um, is, was the uh, democratic government in Germany between World War I and the Nazis rise to power in the early 1930s. Um, <clears throat> it was a constitutional republic. It had a parliament. It had a written constitution. Uh, it had all of the different bureaucracies, that, that, uh, the modern bureaucracies that we know today. Um, but the economy was in lousy shape. And this is because, for those, some of you may, may know this, that at the end of World War I, when the Treaty of Versailles was signed, the German government was required as a part of the armistice to uh, pay reparations to the Allied powers in Europe. Those reparations were oppressive uh, in a lot of ways, and they were designed to be punitive because they were designed to keep Germany from rebuilding their war machine. And so their military was vastly restricted, and their, their trade, what they could manufacture, all these things were, were uh, they had, there were caps and limitations on where and when and how much they could spend on these things, as well as the fact that the government had to repay the Allies damages for World War I. And because of this, Germany was nearly bankrupt, really almost off the bat. Almost right as soon as the treaty was signed, the next couple of years, um, they were in terrible shape. The reparations payments were basically uh, taking all of their capital away from the, from the government. Um, the government began printing fiat currency at a rapid rate uh, so that they could purchase hard currency because the British and the French and the United States required that uh, Germany pay their reparations in in solid uh, currency like British pounds or something like that. Well, the Germans didn't have access to those, so they have to they had to print their own money in order to buy the British pounds or the French francs or whatever it is they needed to pay back the reparations to those countries. And because they, they didn't have enough money to start printing it, well, that rapidly devalued their mark. And the, by 1923, the German mark was basically worthless. Um, the, we, the exchange rate between the U.S. dollar and the German mark was about four million to one, or something in that in that range. Um, now, at the same time, the Weimar government had, was passing these types of laws: labor laws regulating hours worked and regulating a work week. They had a huge health insurance coverage expansion, mandated that every man, woman, and child be covered by health insurance. Uh, progressive income tax with a top bracket of sixty percent. A massive welfare state, social security, government housing, child protective services, and a right to public education. Next slide, Bob. Any of that sound familiar? Yeah. <clears throat> now then, um, if that wasn't bad enough, they had just started to recover a little bit. Uh, with all, even with all that, uh, they brought in um, they brought in wage and price controls. They used uh, the, um, the 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 chancellorship, the German presidency. There, there, the German president was one person, and the chancellor was another person. The chancellor was kind of like the prime minister, sort of like it is today. 
um, and they had a new chancellor, and that person instituted some monetary policy that started easing off some of this. They quit printing money, and they started getting their economic house in order. And at the end of the 1920s, they were kind of stabilizing. Their, their currency had stabilized, and they were on the way back up, and then the Great Depression hit, which basically threw the whole thing back into a tizzy again. And so the German people are having this sort of this economic downturn. I mean, it's one of those things, just when they think they're getting their head above water, boom, they're back down again. And it wears on the population, and, the, and they're, like a lot of populations do, they scream, why isn't the government doing anything about this? Because, yeah, because they've been taught that the government is their savior, okay? Um, and don't forget that the Germans came from a long line of imperial uh, monarchy from the 1800s, and so they were used to being run by a person. Uh, they were used to a cult of personality, the Kaiser, uh, who had uh, started, who had, you know, not started World War I, but been instrumental in starting World War I. So, um, so the German people were used to being led by, by the nose around. They weren't used to governing themselves. And when they got into a situation where they govern, had governed themselves, the people in charge were not competent to do that, and the population didn't know any better. And so things just went to hell in a handbasket, basically. The Depression caused a debt crisis um, because American banks had been propping up Germ German economy and German companies. The American banks had been lending German companies capital to operate their manufacturing businesses. Well, when the, when the American banks went under in the, in the crash, they withdrew their lending authority from the German businesses. And that basically destroyed the manufacturing capability and put a bunch of people out of work. There was mass unemployment. Uh, I think at, at one point, um, a, a fully 20% of the adult population of Germany was unemployed, um, <clears throat> which is huge. And all this happened like within a 12 month period. And so. And the, next, the very next election after that took place, the Nazis came to power. They, were, they, they won about 19% of the seats in parliament, and as a result, had authority. They, they could command a large section of the coalition government. And the very next election, they actually got a majority. And that's when Hitler became chancellor. So just this give you a kind of timeline. Um, in the 1930s, Germans, at the same time all this massive uh, economic downturn was going on, the, the German society had become decadent. You see on the right there, that's a picture of a cabaret. Um, especially in Berlin, uh, sexual permissiveness was rampant, lots of prostitution, sex-oriented businesses, homosexuality was celebrated, drug dealing, black markets. It was a terrible place to live in the 1930s. If any of you guys have seen the musical Cabaret, that's, it's set in this time period, and that's what it's about. Um, <clears throat> so they had a double whammy. They had a terribly permissive, corrupt society, and they had a government that couldn't handle its economic policy, and they had uh, and, and they had the depression to deal with. It was kind of a, a just a, a, a double or triple-edged sword. Okay, go ahead, the next one. Okay, so when the Nazis came to power, and Hitler became chancellor, um, they, th this is what they did. They, in, they engaged in massive government deficit spending on public works projects. Okay, this is when the Autobahn was built, and all those other things that you see in uh, the, the public infrastructure in Germany was built at this time. The idea was to create jobs and end mass unemployment, and in large part, it did. Um, government bailouts were used to save the companies that had failed because the American banks weren't lending them capital anymore. And the German government began appropriating, controlling manufacturing concerns like uh, Daimler-Benz, the automaker, uh, and, other, and uh, the uh, watch companies and all those sorts of things. So the, the, the Nazis began taking control of the means of production. And this was a tenet of National Socialism, uh, which a lot of people see as a far-right ideology, but I think it's really on the left end of the spectrum, along with communism, even though the Nazis hated the communists, and vice versa. And they enacted protectionist legislation which uh, reduced Germany's trade deficit. Okay, go on, Bob. Then we had a terrorism crisis. In 1933, in February, a lone gunman Dutch communist was blamed for setting the Reichstag on fire. That's the German parliament building in Berlin. Um, Hitler called them subhuman, and the press labeled it a monstrous act of terrorism. Um, the next day, Hitler passed the Reichstag fire decree. He was, he was uh, ruling by decree at this time. Uh, this is one of the first things that he did when he was given that authority. It eliminated civil liberties and allowed the imprisonment of, this is political opponents, the slides cut off a little bit, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so, so, here's, so here's what we had. We had a lone gunman terrorist. It's a Patriot um, Act. 
Yeah, exactly. We had, we had the lone gunman terrorist who had, but who was blamed as he was blamed. He was a communist, but he was blamed to, uh, for the fire and for attempting to start a communist revolution in Germany. Um, and as a result, uh, the the government took uh, away a lot of civil liberties from people. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, this is the Reichstag fire decree. I remember Germany had a written constitution at this time, and this is what Hitler said. So on the basis of Article 48, Paragraph 2 of the Constitution of the German Reich, the following is ordered in defense against communist state endangering acts of violence. Articles so, such and such of the Constitution of the German Reich are suspended until further notice. It is therefore permissible to restrict the rights of personal freedom, habeas corpus, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, to organize and assemble the privacy of postal, telegraphic, and telephonic communications. Warrants for house searches, orders for confiscations, as well as restrictions on property are also permissible beyond the legal limits otherwise prescribed. And there you have it. Um, now, the historians to this day still debate about who actually started the Reichstag fire. Uh, there is a large group of people who still believe that it was started by the Nazis. Uh, using this, um, this guy, uh, this Dutch communist, as a scapegoat in order to uh, stir the population up to allow Hitler to rule by decree. But wh whoever started the fire, that's what happened. Um, yeah, so Hitler either planned this out in advance or he didn't let a good crisis go to waste. Okay, next time. Right. So the next, and the next thing they did to take care of things was they scapegoated a large segment of the population. In April 1933, a couple months after the Reichstag fire, the Nazis boycotted all Jewish goods and they and began to vandalize Jewish businesses, spray, spray paint slogans on them like the Jews are our misfortune. Two years later, they passed the Nuremberg Laws where Jews lost their citizenship, they couldn't marry non-Jews, they were also banned from government and professional employment. And not only were they banned from government and professional employment, in other words, they couldn't be doctors, lawyers, or anything like that, any business that was a government contractor also could not hire Jews. So that knocked Jews out of a large segment of the economy. Most of them ended up having to do menial labor because that was all they could get. And then uh, a gentleman in the back talked about this a few minutes ago, the Kristallnacht, which happened in November 1938, the night of broken glass. Um, this picture on the bottom is a picture of a Jewish synagogue in Berlin after Kristallnacht. Um, the SS and the Brown Shirts, which by that time were almost the same organization, had destroyed nearly 8,000 Jewish businesses, synagogues, homes, and schools, hauled 30,000 people off to concentration camps. The pretext for Kristallnacht was the murder of a German diplomat by a Polish Jew in Paris. Um, after the riots, the Nazis taxed 20% of all Jewish property as a fine for the damages which the SS had, in, had committed during Kristallnacht. So the Jews got fine for, da for the damage that, to their own property that the German government did. Uh, and if we can argue whether the SS and the Brown Shirts were actually part of the German government or not, maybe, maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but they certainly were put up to it by them. Um, and not only that, but, and this, I'm sorry, it's cut off again, but about six million marks in insurance payments, which were to be paid to the Jewish business owners for property damage, instead was paid to the state. So the, the German government appropriated their insurance coverage. Um, and this was about 11 months before the beginning of World War II. So that kind of gives you the history of, of uh, briefly, of what happened in Nazi Germany during this time, and I, I hope you can see that some of the things that were going on ha have a strike an eerily familiar chord with things that we are experiencing currently. I'll now turn it over to Bob. Thanks, Ed. You shadow puppet. It's going to be a problem doing a squeal. All right. What I'm going to give you now, just something from recent research, and I thought I would bring it out. I was asked to bring it out. It is actually from secondary sources. I have not gone to primary for source documents. I haven't taken that time yet. Mm -hmm. I'm still asked to present it. The reason is because the implications are significant and the whole idea, and I'm going to ask you to do your research. I'm going to ask you to do your own homework in a whole bit. But it is very much a what's going on today and the possible implications of our near-term future. Okay, basically that's what it amounts to. The uh, first off, the I haven't read the book The Pink Swastika. Okay, just so you know. The um, it's not actually a book report on that. But I have gone out and done some other reading which has some like information, just so you know. Because history is history, right? 
So the, the, I'm going to bring out parts of that just to make you aware of it. When Ted gave this presentation about Germany, there is a, a thread there through German history that is that I'm going to bring out right now and just kind of uh, mention. First off, there's a certain gentleman, Ernst Rome, if I'm pronouncing his name right, Rom? I'm not very good with my German. What do you think, Ted? <laughs> we can't figure it out either, man. All right, okay. All right, you got Rom here, Ernst Rom. All right, he was uh, very, very close to Adolf Hitler. In the very early days, as Hitler was beginning to come to power, you know, before the Nazi Party was formed and all that, working with the brown shirts, Rome was uh, rather influential in this whole thing and, and given a lot of power. Okay, worked through the brown shirts, basically a political organization. Let's, let's kind of look at it as a quasi-political party and also enforcement wing, so to speak. We don't really have too close a parallel in America. What he did, and he was a homosexual, okay? He, um, he worked within the brown shirts, and he actually encouraged homosexuality within it. Now, the, <clears throat> there's a reason for this. It's not about what two guys do in their own bedroom and things like that, okay? Frankly, I didn't want to address that right now, okay? The whole idea of two people of the same gender loving each other, they can, okay? I'm not saying they can't. I'm not even addressing that at all, okay? Just so you know. You'll see where I'm going with this in a moment, but understand, he had power, he got it with the brown shirts. This is the, the priest cursor, is, it morphed into, you might say, the Nazi party and the SS, as Ted made reference to. In, in time, it was rolling that way. What Rom did in time, as the years were passing and they were growing, was the, uh, <clears throat> according to the sources I've been reading, anyway, is a number of the homosexuals are in the brown shirts, came over and took in significant leadership positions within the Hitler Youth. Hitler Youth was an organization, about two and a half million people, and you see that influence was huge because of the whole idea. You get young people that are very impressionable, and whoever reaches them first that they're young enough, with the idea of sexual orientation and pleasures and all, basically turns their body on, if I could put it that way. They have a huge influence and can on their sexual orientation. Now, am I saying that, that that means that nobody's born a homosexual or anything like that? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that at all. Maybe some are, and maybe I, I don't think they all are, okay, by their own confession and all, you gotta see that. But still, that thought, that thought, the homosexual end of it, was brought from the brown shirts, became leadership within the Hitler Youth, and they did have influence on the kids within that program. This is based on the reading of uh, Come Through, and I believe it's in the uh, Hitler Youth as well. Now, what Rom then went on to do was take charge of the military. Okay? A few years go by, there's no doubt that there were members of the Hitler Youth that joined up in the military, and the homosexual influence was there. Here's, here's the interesting part, though. A number of these homosexuals, not all of them, not all, okay? Because there were a bunch that ended up in the concentration camps. They were slated to be killed, and they were. Okay, just as Christians were, and a whole chunk of Jews. Okay, you realize people from different people groups ended up at the wrong side of the, uh, the gas chamber, so to speak. All right, including homosexuals. On the other hand, there were those, shall I say, the more militant strain, who got in the military and had these leadership roles. Here's the issue their values of this particular strain. There were none. That's the problem. They were very degenerate, this particular wing within the homosexual community. And they got in there, they were willing to do whatever it took. Adolf Hitler used this to help bring about the base of power that he enjoyed, okay? In his rise to power, he had a military and a population that would resist letting him do whatever he wanted. They did have some restraints. No, it's not right to just go run out and kill people just for the heck of it, just because I want to take over, all right? Remember, that was his ambition, okay, Hitler. He had to go ahead and move an entire population to kind of support that. He had to hyper-militarize his own military with people that would simply obey orders and kill in mass. He achieved that, okay? And this particular segment of the homosexual population, the militant homosexuals, I might say, 
they helped to enable that. Were they everything? No. But they were a part of it. They were a part of what facilitated this whole thing. And Ram, being a homosexual running through here, he had his day in that. He got so powerful, Hitler eventually took him out. Actually had him killed. So it's, understand, it's, it's Hitler, <laughs> it, it's, it's not like he had this great love for homosexuals. I don't think he did. I think he used them. All right, and that's all that really happened in that regard. Okay? It's all about power. It's all about power and who makes themselves available to be used. Restraints were down. Now understand, can two people love each other? Yes. What they do in the bedroom? Well, by my Christian values and the whole bit, the way I read the Bible, it's a sin. The answer isn't to kill anybody. The answer is to help bring people to Christ to see a better way. The answer truly is to love. It is to show compassion, all right? But still, understand, you let this keep going, you get a problem. Now, what I'm going to bring out today is from my own study, secondary sources. Please take this as my opinion, okay? I can't evaluate motive. I can show you what I do know from my reading and my concerns about where it could potentially go. In America today, there's a gentleman named Robert Gates. Member of the Council on Foreign Relations, very distinguished career, very intelligent gentleman. He's a genius, no doubt about it in my mind. I give him a lot of credit. Go look him up on Wikipedia, and you'll see. Very well placed, very well trusted. During the early 19, uh, yeah, 1990s, he uh, rose to the ranks of becoming the director of the CIA. Okay? During that time period, maybe shortly afterwards, they actually, they actually, shortly afterwards, they enabled this, or they, they brought out this program called Angle within the CIA. And the whole idea is to bring in homosexuals into the CIA. I don't have an exact start date based on the research I did, but he was an enabler. Okay? A few years later, under George W. Bush, and then carried on into the Barack Obama, okay, he did a rare thing as a cabinet official, he was Secretary of Defense. He was actually Secretary of Defense, two different presidents and two different parties. It's kind of a rare thing, okay? I do believe it's because of how gifted he was, or is, still is. During his tenure within the uh, Secretary of Defense, remember Don't Ask, Don't Tell? He got rid of that, and he said, okay, you know, basically let open homosexuals, so to speak, into the military. Guess what's next? What's in the middle? Do you know who leads the Boy Scouts of America today? Robert Gates heads the Boy Scouts today. As I understand, it's a rotating position every two years. He's about a year into it. And he said, it's time to um, allow open homosexuals in. Okay? Basically, it's you know, my paraphrase of what he says. The, if I got it right, it's the executive committee. Okay, mind you, there are several committees. There is a process that has to go through. They recently unanimously voted, unanimously according to what I've read, okay, to say, okay, we need to open up the Boy Scout leadership to uh, homosexuals. Now, the way they would do that is they wouldn't require that of all the troops. The individual Boy Scout troops could decide for themselves what their leadership, whether, you know, their own policy there, whether they're going to allow homosexuals in or not. Okay, they would, national Boy Scouts would no longer it would be up to the troops, okay? Well, how far do you think that's going to go? I'd just like to ask, okay? The, um, do you see the pattern here? You see the pattern? Now, here's a question for you. Is Robert Gates intentionally trying to set up a foundation that is a reflection of what happened in Germany? Well, I don't know. I haven't seen the evidence for it. Do you want my opinion? He's a history, he's a history buff. He has an advanced degree in history, according to the uh, Wikipedia. Remember, that's a secondary source, right? It's not like I've seen his diploma and all that, okay? If that is all true, 
I don't doubt he's familiar with what happened in Germany. I'm concerned, folks. Okay, now, this whole, this whole thing about Robert Gates and what he's doing right now, I do think it's worthy of, a, of an additional investigation, a second look. Because we, history does repeat itself. We do fall into these patterns. Now, are all homosexuals out to take advantage of the Boy Scouts? No. I don't think so at all. Not at all. There will be a sliver that will. There will be a sliver that will. Okay? All right. I worry about that. I worry about that. If you take a look at what happened in Germany, <clears throat> oh, let's, let's go to Romans for a moment. Got a minute. Romans 1. Read Romans 1. You see a trail. You actually see a trail of uh, people going through a decay. The whole idea of first they're going to fold themselves and think that they're smarter than God. Okay? They run through the whole idea of promiscuity and uh, fornication and adultery. They get into idol worship. Along the path there, open homosexuality comes out. That is not where it ends. This is not where it ends. What happens after the whole, you read that chapter, Romans 1, after open homosexuality comes lawlessness. Lawlessness is not where <clears throat> there's nobody in charge. They just don't obey the law. They become the law. They can do whatever they want. They're not restrained by law. Okay? This is what happened with Hitler. After the fire, the, the Reichstag and a whole bit, okay, through the whole process and all, he basically was given authority in law and said, hey, Adolf Hitler, you can do whatever you want. Okay, it was written right into their code. Because people were desperate, they were starving, they were hungry, they needed a solution. They gave up the process of law to one man to solve the problem. And he exploited them in his attempt to conquer Europe. He exploited them. He used that. Lawlessness is what I fear through a series of events. Remember the night of crystal? Crystal night? Forget the German pronunciation. Again, the whole issue of the Reichstag and what happened there. It's their version of Congress, by the way, their Capitol building, you know, their, their parliament. Okay? Events like that. And at the same time, the economy crumbling. How many people today are worried in America about our economy going away of Greece? Okay? If you follow the map on fractional reserve banking, we're heading there. It's only a matter of when and how that we're going to have to deal with that reality. When our economy goes through that motion, maybe it'll be a slow degree like we see in Greece, maybe it'll be faster, I don't know. But I do know this, we can't keep incurring the debt. Eventually it's got to stop and eventually we've got to pay the piper. When that happens, take a look at your fellow Americans. How many will become desperate and say, look, just feed me? Lawlessness. I don't care what you do. Just feed me. It's where it goes. And at that point, I don't know who. I'm not saying it's Robert Gates. If I got it right, he's 71 years old right now if I did my math. Okay? And uh, heading up to Boy Scouts. I personally tend to believe he's an enabler in this. But he's not our Adolf Hitler. Don't get me wrong. I don't know who it is. I don't know who it is. But we're creating the environment to have exactly that. All we need are a couple, three events. Do events drive us? Did 9-11 shape and mold us? Sure. Events cause things to happen and change how we work. We get a down economy. We get a people who have forgotten the place of law for the sake of eating. See, we're setting ourselves up for this environment. Will the homosexual community and mass go along with this? It did not in Germany. But it didn't take all of them. Okay? There were a bunch of homosexuals in Germany that were killed. I wouldn't be surprised to see that here. And I'm not talking about Christians killing. I'm talking about the idea of those few that want to massacre to a power, and they'll kill anybody to get it. Okay, we're setting up the environment. Will some be taken advantage of? Yeah, I think so. I think so. We're setting ourselves up for that. You take a look at gay pride parades, which you see, or it's on when they're on display. Homosexuals are out there doing their thing. It's not all bad that I've seen from beginning to end. It's not all bad, but guess what's in the middle of it? You get those elements, so you think, 
I'm worried about you. <laughs> okay? All right? So understand, this is not a slam on all homosexuality. Although I do believe it's a sin, they do need to come to Christ, just as a thief does, just as i got to deal with my weight. I'm obese. I'm a glutton. The reality is, I need to turn that over to Christ. No different than anybody else. We all have our areas of struggle. Homosexuality is another one on the list. Alright? And yes, I struggle with my weight problem. But I'm not an open glutton. I don't celebrate it. I don't honor it as being something noble. I did eat too much for lunch. You get the idea. See that difference? I'm worried about where this is going and how the homosexual, some segment of the homosexual community can get abused. It's not about the bedroom. Not about two people loving each other. It's about a lack of values and how they get taken advantage of. You see that in Germany? Can you see that happening in America? That's what I fear. I'd like to open it up for questions, by the way. Any questions? Bob, I suggest that every question be prefaced with a confession. <laughs> you all have to confess before you question. Me, I'm perfect. I have absolutely no sin in my life at all, period, except for pride. <laughs> now that that's out of the way. OK, who wants to ask the first question? I'm going to start in the back with Pastor Kern. I'll work my way up. You guys are going to have to park the water. Let's see here. Park the water. Just a point of clarification. I agree with uh, Bob what he's been saying. Uh, I've read the book, Pink Swastika. The author is a personal friend of mine. Uh, in the homosexual situation in Germany, you had two different groups. You had those that were the uh, the butchers and the effeminate? Yeah, exactly. And the, the butchers were the kind that basically uh, followed the Spartans, the Spartacus idea, uh, which was very much involved in, in homosexuality. The other side were not. And so you have a conflict there. But my point is, is that I agree too that in the homosexual situation today, the activists, the, the homosexual activists, are kind of like the uh, what you were describing there uh, in Germany. Uh, not all of the homosexuals are involved in that, that level of activism, but we do see the same kind of ideology in the uh, the side, the Bush side that, that was in Germany that, that was determined to take it, everything over. Yes. yes. Watch out for the ones trying to use government to force you to be a servant or slave. Yes. Who's next? Okay, the Murrah building, if you watch a noble lie, perhaps that was equivalent to the Reichstag fire. Yeah. They were trying to start something, but it didn't work. I think it was a test to see how well 9-11 would work when they went bigger. What else? Whose hand was up over here? Gil, was that you? Jerome Montgomery. I think if you look at the uh, French Dominican, or whatever it's called, in Waco, Texas, at the, that one there, and if you look at the one down here at the Murrah building, and then you take in 1993, when they had the Murrah, the bombing of the World Trade Center, and then the thing morphed to 95 here, and then back to the World Trade Center, it's a process of patient gradualism and conditioning of the mind to gradually escalate the problem, whereas people will begin to accept it. And that's the danger right there, and that's where we're at. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Who is going to be the next Jews that are going to be persecuted and hung out to dry? Christians. I already feel persecuted. Yeah, I think we know the answer to that. Christian in America. All right. Does anybody know what we're doing next week? Sorry, I can't promote next week. I don't know what we're doing yet, but it'll be good. <laughs> Stay tuned on the same bet, same bad time, same bad channel. Oh, bad channel. Stand up, Steve. Give us your last parting shot. This next week, I'll be talking about Randy Brogdon's comments. I will be talking about the Oklahoma Constitution's 
conservative index and the awards that we decided to give. I'll give some kudos to some lawmakers and point out some really goofus ones. So that'll be fun, and then we'll uh, meet and have a good time here at church next Wednesday. See you all then.